It's good to be back at this college. Uh, the last time I came here, actually, my wife, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, did pick up a research assistant who's now doing great work for her as a Hillsdale student. And so I'm hopeful with a number of students in the audience that, uh, that I might pick up some interns or future hires tonight as well. I've already been talking to a few prospective candidates. I was sitting next to Emily, who asked me what my favorite state was. Was it Ohio, where I'm from? And I said, Ohio's a good state. I can't say it's the best state. She said, I can tell you what's the best state. It's Indiana, where she's from. <laughs> so it's the uh, cussedness of the Hillsdale student. But uh, the, uh, the funny story is, so Dr. Arn mentions my dad coming to this country. I'm sitting next to Emily, who's from Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'll tell you a funny story about my father, who, who first came to this country, to Cincinnati, Ohio. And I asked him, why did you come halfway around the world to Cincinnati, Ohio, of all places? And he says that it was because his older sister had actually settled in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he had to find a place that was close to her, which of course begged the question of why his older sister came halfway around the world <laughs> to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Maybe it's because it's the best state, but the family joke is it's the only US state with the word India contained in the <laughs> name of the state. So, uh, <laughs> Emily, you reminded me of that story. Uh, so, you know, I, actually, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about tonight picks up where Dr. Arn left off, which was why my parents came to this country. The answer to that question relates to who we are as a people, and it turns out it's not a geographic space that we all roam as a different colored group of higher mammals doing what iPhones tell us to do on a given day. I know that's how it looks sometimes, but it is a vision of a nation that brought together a divided polyglot group of people 250 years ago. And the subject of my talk today is going to be the national identity crisis that we're going through today. I'm 37 years old. I was born in 1985. I speak as a member of my generation. When I say that we today are hungry for a purpose, my generation, we are hungry for a cause. We're hungry for identity. At a moment in our national history when the things that used to give us that sense of purpose, faith, patriotism, hard work, family. Those things have disappeared. They have receded in modern American life. And we suffer from depression and anxiety and a mental health epidemic as we flail from one secular religion to another, from transgenderism to climatism to COVIDism just as part of our deeper search for meaning, even as we cannot quite answer the question of what it even means to be an American in the year 2023. What does it mean to be American today? I think we lack an answer to that question. Our lack of an answer to that question is the black hole at the center of our nation's soul. And when you have a vacuum that runs that deep, that is when poison begins to fill the void. That's going to be the subject of my next half hour, taking a stab at the answer of what it does mean to be an American in the year 2023. I'll take you back to the moment in 1993 when I was in second grade in Evendale Elementary in southwest Ohio, when I heard Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech for the first time. That was the speech where he said, I hope my four children grow up in a country where they are judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. I'll tell you, that dream, it stuck with me. It meant something to me, because it was the dream that allowed my dad to come to this country over 40 years ago and build a successful career for himself at the GE plant in Evendale, Ohio, despite the fact that he had a thick Indian accent. He still does to this day. It was the dream that allowed me to go in a single generation from being the kid of Indian immigrants who came to this country with almost no money to becoming the founder of a multi-billion dollar biotech company. I had the privilege of leading that company as a CEO for seven years. We worked on a number of medicines for patients. Five of them are FDA approved drugs today. The one I'm personally most proud of is an approved drug for prostate cancer. But I stepped down as CEO of that company several years ago, to focus on a different kind of cancer. 
not a biological cancer, but a cultural cancer that threatened to kill that dream that Martin Luther King had 60 years ago, that threatened to kill the dream that allowed me to achieve everything I ever had in my life. And that is this new secular religion in America whose belief system centers on the idea that your identity is based on your race, your gender, and your sexual orientation, full stop. It says that America is a systemically racist country, that if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged, that if you're white, you're inherently privileged. No matter your economic background or upbringing, your race and your gender govern who you are and what you can achieve in life and even what you can say, even what you can think. It's a really clever statement of this new philosophy from Congresswoman Ayanna Presley of the Squad. I'm grateful to her for articulating it so succinctly when she said that we do not want any more black faces that do not want to be a black voice, that we don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice, end quote. I do not fit her description of what counts as a brown voice, no doubt, but there's a really clever move embedded in there. And it's this, if your race goes from being about the color of your skin to being about the content of the ideas you're allowed to espouse, then any disagreement with those ideas automatically makes you a racist. And there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist or the equivalent of a racist in our social hierarchy, climate denier, bigot, homophobe, so on. And so when given the choice between pledging allegiance to this new religion and being tarred with the scarlet R, everyday Americans are choosing to bend the knee. And that is what's created this new culture of fear in our country, fear of losing your jobs, Fear of your kids getting a bad grade in school. Fear of becoming a pariah in your own community. And that culture of fear is what's replaced our culture of free speech in America. And if you ask me, the best measure of the health of any democracy, especially American democracy, it isn't the number of ballots that get cast every November. That's just fetishizing the final act at the end of the process. It is the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public. And right now, we are doing abysmally on that metric. Now, in order to know where you want to go, you have to know what got you to where you are. And part of the story of what got us here actually began through none other than a perversion of capitalism itself dating back to the 2008 financial crisis. On the back of the bailouts, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, something really interesting happened in this country. It's not just that Barack Obama was elected president, though that was part of it. In the wake of the bailouts, there was a grand bargain in this country, an unspoken grand bargain between big business and what used to be our conception of big government. It went like this, okay? If you're gonna get that public money to save the bankers when times go bad, but you made a lot of money when times went good, then the Occupy Wall Street movement has a claim on that wealth. What the Occupy Wall Street movement said is we're gonna take that money from those wealthy corporate fat cats and redistribute it to poor people to help poor people. But right around that time, there was a new birth of progressivism in this country that had a different theory of the case. And what they had to say was, you know what? The real problem wasn't quite just economic injustice, it wasn't quite just poverty, no, it was racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry and climate change. And that actually presented a lifeline to big business in this country. Because if you're Wall Street, you don't like Occupy Wall Street very much, but the new woke stuff is actually pretty easy. You applaud diversity and inclusion, put some token minorities on your boards, you muse about the racially disparate impact of climate change after you fly in that private jet to Davos, it's pretty good work if you can get it. But they didn't do it for free. There was an implicit ask in return that the new left looked the other way when it came to leaving their corporate power intact. And it worked so well for Wall Street that Silicon Valley then get in on the act. What Silicon Valley realized was that the old version of breakup big tech used to come from the left. Well, here's what we can do. We will use our monopoly power to advance your ideas. We will use our monopoly power to take down hate speech or misinformation as you define it, but we will not do it for free. 
we expect the new progressive movement to look the other way when it comes to leaving our monopoly power intact. That is the story of this arranged marriage. It is not an arranged marriage of love. It is more like mutual prostitution. And the net result of that act is the birth of this new ESG industrial, woke industrial complex that's actually a new hybrid of state power and corporate power that's far more powerful than either one alone. And when you get that much power concentrated in the way that it is, state power and corporate power combined, then it lends itself to capture. And that's what happened in more recent years when a new actor showed up on the scene and turned that arranged marriage into a three-party affair. That is the Communist Party of China. They understand this game far more deeply than any of us do. What they realized is, okay, now, we can take this one step further. If we can get those same companies that will critique the United States relentlessly, that will apply emissions caps over there in their apologist model of capitalism, to do business in China without saying a peep about the actual human rights atrocities over here, we have undermined America's greatest geopolitical asset of all, and that is not our nuclear arsenal. It is our moral standing on the global stage. That's how you get Disney, who two years ago will say it can't shoot a film in the state of Georgia if Georgia passes an anti-abortion statute. That it says it cannot abide a new law in Florida that prevents public school teachers from teaching six-year-olds about transgenderism and gender identity. But will go in the same period to film Mulan in the Xinjiang province of China, literally ground zero of the Uyghur human rights crisis, where there are over one million religious minorities enslaved in concentration camps subject to forced sterilization, communist indoctrination, and worse, without saying a peep, until the very end of the movie, you could still see it in the credits today, where they say, we thank the local authorities for allowing us the privilege of filming here. Reminds me of those trees in Harlem. That was what Disney got out of that trade. <laughs> but it turns out every other company's doing the same thing. Nike, BlackRock, Airbnb. J.P. Morgan Chase, the NBA, why do they do it? The answer is actually really simple. It comes down to money. Because if you're the CCP, you build a great Chinese wall that prevents you from entering the Chinese market if you criticize the CCP. But if you criticize the United States or hamstring its economy with those emissions caps, we will roll out the red carpet. And so companies do what companies do. That is why Tim Cook and... Larry Fink are Xi Jinping's circus monkeys. He will say jump, they will say how high, because it comes down to their bottom line. It is the direct product of a bipartisan consensus in this country back in the 1990s. Conviction in the faith of democratic capitalism. The idea that somehow we could use capitalism as a vehicle to spread democracy to places like China. The idea that we could export Big Macs and Happy Meals and somehow that was going to spread freedom. Well, what they realized is they could turn that game on its head. We thought we could use our money to get them to be more like us. They realized they could use their money, access to their market, to get us to be more like them. <laughs> or even one step better than that, that they could use our money to get us to be more like them sending back those Disney movies and iPhones as Trojan horses to undermine the United States from within. So that is the problem, as I see it. The concentration of state power and corporate power that lends itself to capture, facing down a threat far more deep and dangerous than we've anything we've faced in our nation's history. The Soviet Union did not supply the shoes on our feet or the phones in our pocket. That is what makes our unique moment far more complicated than anything I think we faced in the latter half of the 20th century. So where do we go from here? My first view is that not, against, not all solutions will be delivered or ought to be delivered through politics. I think that market actors can play a role. Part of the concentration of power starts with the inappropriate government-coordinated concentration of capital. The three largest financial institutions and asset managers in this country are BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, three institutions 
who together manage about $20 trillion. That is about as much money as the United States GDP in three hands, the largest aggregation of capital in private hands in human history, certainly in American history. And yet all of those firms are using that money, with due respect, probably including money of most of you in this room, to vote for racial equity audits at companies like Apple or scope three emissions caps at companies like Chevron, implementing political and social agendas that nobody voted for, using the money of everyday citizens to advance one-sided agendas that most of those everyday citizens actually disagree with. Actually, there's a really funny twist in this story. BlackRock is actually the firm that causes firms like Exxon and Chevron to drop oil production projects here at home. You might wonder if this might actually serve as at least one small step forward in the march against global climate change. Even then, you'd be wrong because it turns out many of those same projects are still proceeding only under different ownership, under the ownership of the likes of PetroChina, who's buying up the very projects that Chevron is dropping. And then you look up who's one of the largest foreign shareholders of PetroChina. And it's actually none other than BlackRock using Chinese citizens' capital to own that company instead. That's how deep this problem runs. But market actors can make a difference. This is why I founded Strive a little over a year ago to compete with BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, using shareholder power, the money of everyday citizens, to deliver a different message to corporate America, to tell companies to focus exclusively on excellence over politics, on making excellent products and services for your customers without apology, and yes, making money in the process, maximizing value for your shareholders without apology, and to dilute the power exercised by this small handful of actors. We're about a year into this. I'll tell you that when J.P. Morgan Chase got into the exchange-traded funds business, it took them over a year, over two years, actually, to cross a billion dollars in assets under management. We crossed 500 million, half a billion in our first three months. I hope that this is just the beginning of a bottom-up revolution. I remember when we talked about this the last time I came here, we hadn't even gotten started, Dr. Arn, and we're well on our way to hopefully driving that change through the corporate sector. But market solutions alone are not going to be enough to spawn the national revival that we need. I think we need an awakening of a new conservative movement, a new American movement in this country that answers that question that our generation longs for. What does it mean to be an American in the year 2023? Our inner animal spirit has been domesticated, it has been tamed by this new culture that rejects truth and embraces relativism, that rejects God and embraces secularism, that rejects democracy and embraces aristocracy, that rejects free speech and embraces censorship, that rejects equality of opportunity and embraces equity of results, that rejects excellence and embraces victimhood. That inner animal, it has left oceans to lift up countries like China on the other side of the world, while their culture of Maoist victimhood has left oceans in the other directions to hold us back. You know what I say, when we rallied, many of us did behind the cry to make America great again, I don't think we hungered for a single man. I think we hungered for the unapologetic pursuit of excellence in our country. Thank you. Thank you. This is deeply personal to me. I told you about my parents. They came here in the late 70s and early 80s, respectively. I was born in the mid 80s. Had I been born 20 years earlier in this country, I don't think my story would have been possible, not in the same way. But what worries me is that had I been born 20 years later, I'm not sure my story would have been possible either. You see, to me, the American dream, it's not just about going from being middle class or not rich to making a lot of money. The American dream is about a conviction in your agency as an individual, 
a belief that you are more than the tectonic plates of group identity that move you, the genetics that brought you into this world, a conviction in your purpose as a citizen. That is really what the American dream means to me. And for me as a kid who grew up with a funny last name, nerdy glasses, skinny kid with a dad who had a funny accent in Southwest Ohio when I grew up, merit and achievement was our ticket ahead. You know what, if you're going to, thank you very much, if you're going to be that kid who stands out from the group, you might as well be outstanding. That's what my parents taught me, okay? To get ahead through hard work, that hardship is not the same thing as victimhood, that there is more to life than self-indulgence, that in today's terms, there's more to life and there's a greater point than figuring out your gender. There are things to do, things to be accomplished in the world. We have much to do in the short time we have been given. That is the American dream. Those are the values that brought my parents to this country and that they instilled in us today. We should want more people like that entering this country. We would do well to restore meritocracy in who gets into this country. Thank you. Thank you. My parents, they worked hard. They paid their taxes. They followed the rules. They raised two kids who went on to found companies that employed thousands of people and improved the lives of thousands of Americans. That is a good thing. They made sacrifices to raise a family. Through their example taught us that there is more to leadership than just following your latest whim, that you have to make a sacrifice to be in a marriage, that you have to make a sacrifice to be a father and a mother, but that those sacrifices are worth making because it is in service of something greater than yourself. Those are the immigrants we want rather than people whose first act of entering this country is by definition a law-breaking one. I think we need, I speak as a first generation American when I say this, we need to secure that border unapologetically and restore meritocracy over lawlessness in determining not only who gets into America, but then who gets ahead in America. Revive our conviction, thank you. That Martin Luther King was right that you get ahead in America not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. It's gonna say something that's gonna be very difficult for a lot of people to swallow, but that means that when the Supreme Court overturns affirmative action in college admissions, as I hope and expect they will later this year, every college in the country may follow the Hillsdale Way, but not just every college in the country, every institution in this country, moving beyond the de facto racism that has defined our hiring practices, our merit practices in the private sector and in every other sphere of American life. Now, a lot of people don't know this. Affirmative action actually started its spread in America with the actions of the federal government itself, where, where most bad things often begin. There was a Johnson-era executive order, and not a lot of people know this. It's, a, it's a been a national cancer on our soul. Under Lyndon Johnson, an executive order, it's 11246, what it says is that if you're doing business with the federal government, if you're a government contractor, that might sound like a side category. No, it's over 20% of the U.S. workforce, from Boeing to Google, are encompassed by this executive order. If you do any business with the government, you have to adopt racial quota systems in your hiring practices. We have three Republican presidents since who could have rescinded that with a stroke of a pen. They each chose not to because of the fear of political backlash. I think there's an opportunity in this country to not only overturn affirmative action in college admissions, but to eradicate it in every sphere of our lives, starting with the actions and the example of the federal government itself. It's not just merit in who gets in and who gets ahead, but even meritocracy in government itself. This is not a Republican idea or a Democratic idea, but I have, a, I have my own dream as an American. 
that the people who we elect to run the government are actually the people who run the government. <laughs> Thank you. It may seem like that's not a lot to ask, but that's not the case today. Right? The next time you have an unelected bureaucrat like Anthony Fauci or Merrick Garland or James Comey, for that matter, who wishes to exercise political power that no one elected them to exercise, you need chief executives at the federal level and at the state level who will do what they're constitutionally empowered to do, to fire them, to fire the legions of people under them, to fire the managerial industrial complex around them. Because you know what? If somebody works for you and you can't fire them, that means they don't work for you. It means you work for them. It means you are their slave because you are accountable for what, they're, what they do without having any responsibility for what they do. They will say that they have civil service protections in this country. Well, I personally view those as unconstitutional because Article II of the Constitution is higher in the hierarchy of our nation's laws than any law that Congress passed. But even if it were true that we have these civil service protections, it's got to be the top of a new conservative movement, a new pro-American movement's agenda in this country to repeal those civil service protections. And if you ask me, replace them with sunset clauses instead. To say that if you can't be a federal employee as the president of the United States for more than eight years, that you probably shouldn't be an employee of the federal government for more than eight years, no matter what position that you're serving in, <laughs> and bring that fresh lifeblood, not just into our country, but into our federal government. Now, one of the areas where I care about meritocracy is not just who rules in government, but the ideas that prevail in our society and in our government too. And we can only have a meritocracy of ideas in America if we embrace one of the foundational cornerstones of the great American experiment, and that is free speech. Free speech is a precondition, you see it right here, for the pursuit of truth. I personally believe that free speech is also a precondition for peace in America. Because if you tell people they cannot speak, that is when they scream. But you tell people they can't scream, that is when they tear things down. And today, we have in this country a form of censorship that's not what a lot of people on cable television like to call it big tech censorship. I call it what it really is. It is government tech censorship. It is the government using private companies to do through the back door what government could not do through the front door under the Constitution to censor politically disfavored speech. We need to abandon the slogans we memorized in 1980 saying that these are private companies free to decide what does and doesn't show up on their website. That's true if they're behaving as private companies, but if they're doing the dirty work of government, if it is state action in disguise, then the Constitution still applies, and these companies ought to be bound by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States when they're coordinating with the government to do what the government itself could not do directly. Thank you. But our censorship culture, it's not just limited to the internet. It extends into the workforce and into our economy. The number of individuals in the American workforce who were fired for saying the wrong thing at work, wearing the hat of the wrong political candidate, posting the wrong thing on social media, showing up at the wrong political rally, staggering over the last three years. You know what I say is that if you can't fire somebody or deplatform somebody on account of their race or their sex or their sexual orientation or their religion or their national origin, then you should not be able to fire somebody or deplatform somebody on account of their political speech either. I personally believe we need to make political expression a civil right in this country right up there next to the other protected classes. Thank you. Now, now, there's a 1980 version of the conservative in me, okay, that would say that these are private businesses, that we shouldn't want to interfere, that we should leave this to the market, that if these businesses over here want to fire these great conservatives, 
That's an opportunity for these other businesses to hire them instead. Leave it to the market, no more regulation. You know what I said? I said, I said there's cer certain logic to that. But you cannot have it both ways, okay? If you want to go back and repeal those protected classes and really leave it to the market in the year 2023 to do its work, great. I'll be right there with you. But so long as we're not doing that, we have to apply these standards even-handedly to say that if you can't fire somebody or deplatform somebody because they're black or gay or Muslim or white or Christian or Jewish or Hindu or whatever, that you should not be able to fire them just because they're an outspoken conservative or an outspoken liberal either. We need to apply these standards even-handedly. And I don't think we even need to wait for legislatures to act, though for the last two years I've been calling on them to. I think that there's rampant breaches of existing civil rights laws as they exist in America already. I'll give you my favorite one. So the prohibition on religious discrimination under the civil rights statutes in this country, actually a lot of people don't know this, doesn't just mean that you can't discriminate against an employee on account of their religion, but it also means that you as the employer, in most cases, cannot force your employee to bow down to your religion. Well, that then just raises the simple question of whether the modern woke agenda, DEI agenda in corporate America meets the Supreme Court's test for what counts as a religion. Turns out you go down the criteria the court has laid out, meets that test to a T. Certain words you can't say, clothes you can't wear, apologies you must recite, excommunication procedures that must be initiated. You know, secular humanism actually counts under the Supreme Court's standards for what counts as a religion. If that's the case, the modern woke agenda meets that test in spades. And so the good news is I think that there are opportunities not to just have to, to reinvent the legislative wheel, but to apply the laws that already got us as far as we already have. And I think if we're able to do those things, to revive the basic ideas that got us to where we are, that the people who we elect to run the government run the government, that we're free to speak openly as long as our neighbors have the same courtesy in return, that you get ahead in this country not on the color of your skin but the content of your character, that you get ahead based on merit, that we put the merit back into America to say that you can achieve anything you ever want in this country with your own hard work and commitment and dedication and believe in that vision of the American dream, then we can take on the single greatest external threat that we will face in our generation. We face an enemy in communist China that powers our modern way of life. In China, there's no distinction between economic policy and military policy. They are two sides of the same coin. Now, we depend on China. We got to where we are, but going forward, if we're really going to declare independence from China, and I do think that that is what the Declaration of Independence in 2023 calls for. That's going to involve some level of sacrifice. It's going to involve some level of trade-off to be able to achieve semiconductor self-sufficiency before China invades Taiwan while we have to protect Taiwan vigorously to protect our own way of life. To be able to shore up our own energy leadership position globally by abandoning the constraints of a new climate religion that shackles the West while leaving China untouched. To tell our children to lead them rather than to be afraid of them, saying that, you know what, if you can't smoke an addictive cigarette by the time you're 18 years old, you probably should not be using addictive social media apps like TikTok until you're 16 years old or later either, if at all. Tell businesses, and thank you, businesses in this country that you will not do business in China until the CCP reforms its behaviors, including abandoning its practices of intellectual property theft, US user data theft, and the other practices that don't make this a capitalist game, but a mercantilist one. Holding communist China accountable for the COVID-19 pandemic, the worst pandemic in over a century, unleashing hell on the rest of the world, using every financial lever we have to do it, because if we don't, we can expect even worse in the future. These will not be easy things to do. They will involve short-term sacrifices. They will involve short-term pain. But America's current moment calls for one of your favorites, for Churchill, not for Chamberlain. 
And I believe we can make these sacrifices. We can rise to that occasion if we really answer that question of who we are as Americans. We have celebrated for the last decade our diversity and our differences, forgetting all of the ways in which we are really just the same as one people. Our diversity is not our strength. Our strength is that which binds us together across our diversity. E pluribus unum, from many, one. That is the vision that won the American Revolution 250 years ago. That is the vision that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the vision that won us World War I and World War II and the Cold War. That is the vision that still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive those common ideals over fractious group identity and grievance, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about, and that is what we're going to need to revive in order to save this great nation. Thank you, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.